<laughs> Thanks all. Cheers. Brian Hall talking about like words or something. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, last year in my workshop, uh, a couple of my participants said, I was asking, gee, how do you like the conference? How do you like the... Rah, rah, rah. And they were saying that they enjoyed the craft talks, but that they felt that to a certain extent, among at least uh, us prose writers, that our craft talks were kind of pitched more to our colleagues, the other teachers, than perhaps to the workshop attendees. And the specific point that they asked for was they wanted somebody to do a talk which was just, they were speaking to me, saying, what do you do when you're sitting down at the computer or the screen in the morning and you're starting something? What are the things that you do? What are the decisions that you make as you do them? And so it was kind of a, 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 a kind of one of those, you know, sort of simple requests of how is it that you go about writing? And I think one of the reasons I'd never thought about doing it is that it can feel, when you stand up here, as it is feeling for me right now, it can feel kind of self-regarding. Here's my process. But I did want to try to honor that request um, because it isn't anything that I'd ever done before. And I've, so this is, I'm, all I've done is I've printed out the first three pages of two different chapters in the book that I'm working on. These are, these are things that are very early on in my own writing process for this book. The thing about um, working with word processors is that about 12 initial drafts don't show up ever in the printout. Uh, the way I work, and I think a lot of people do this, there's this awful lot of word substitution, changes of direction, changes of decisions that just stay on the screen. By the time I print out a version, I'm in a draft that I've done. You know, if I were working at hand, you'd see instead one of those glorious things you see from the 40s of a writer's work with all that stuff. And I can't, I can't show that here. Um, I do remember a fair amount of what was going through my mind as I first tried to tackle these two voices. And so all I'm going to do is start sort of at the very, I may only get through half of a page. I had three printed out just in case, but knowing the way I tend to go on, it'll, it'll probably just be a small amount. This won't be probably helpful to everybody in the room, you know, writers with a number of books under their belt, I, I doubt I'll be saying anything at all earth shattering. But so it's, it's really, you know, hopefully will be helpful to some people who haven't written as much yet. Um, the, first, the first one I want to look at is the one that says Mark at the top. Um, he so wh what, I, what I'm trying to do, this is the very first thing I've written in Mark's voice. Um, it, may not, it may not actually open the novel, but it, but it might. Um, but when, I, when I'm sitting down and I'm looking at, and, and I've got that blank screen in front of me, um, for me, a huge amount of what goes on because I like and write, ever since my second novel, I write basically entirely in what's sometimes called close third. Doesn't uh, Woods, he has some, James Wood, he has some fancy title for it. Free indirect style. style. I've never quite understood why he calls it that, but in case that's the title you like. But it's, it's, it's where you're in the third person, but but every choice that you make, every word that you use, you're trying to make sure you limit yourself to the words that this character would use, the things that this character would notice. I like the style a lot. I think it gives a lot of flexibility. I think it gives a lot of intimacy 
intimacy is the most thing. But the other thing I like about it is I think a lot of us struggle, especially, well, at all points in writing, or I think particularly at the beginning, with the, f the paralysis of freedom. And if you are doing the free and direct style or the close third, from the very beginning, you're, you're, you're shut out of a lot of options because you have decided to, refra to, to um, keep yourself entirely focused on only this person's way of thinking and seeing. And, 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 so, and they'll only see certain things. So uh, what I do ahead of time is I've spent a fair amount of time, sometimes months, taking notes about the kind of person I want to whose perspective I want to write from. So that by the time I'm really trying to first tackle text, I do have some preliminary sense of the kind of person I'm doing, which, which then helps me limit things. So this guy, Mark, he's, in this case, Mark is to a fair amount based on me. I haven't done this in a long time, since my first novel, which was overly autobiographical, and, and kind of unconsciously overly autobiographical. Now I'm being overly autobiographical, but in a very self-conscious way, I hope. <laughs> um, he's based a fair amount on me, especially his childhood. So this, so one of the first decisions I try to make, and then I change it constantly, is whether I want to be in the present tense or the past tense. I, I sense from my reading of, of either student work when I'm teaching in the regular year here or sometimes at workshop, that maybe I obsess over tense more than some people do. I think some people maybe don't think that much about which tense. I, I tend to think that in a pretty subtle way, it's kind of important what tense you're going to be in. Um, this one is in the moment, in the present. I started it in past. I switched it into present early on. And then, I don't know if you can read it, but I've noted on this, since printing this out, that I'm going to put it back into the past. The reason is for this book, the pre for me, the present tense, if you're doing memories, which this is, Mark is a middle-aged guy, like me, um, in, the, in the present of this book, which is 2014. I want the memories to feel very vivid, and I want them to not feel like it's him sitting in a room remembering these things, but rather in a way like recalling up. And so that's why I originally had them in present. The reason I'm going to switch it into past is because actually I want to structurally organize the novel so that the present tense stuff is always the 2014 stuff. And that is mainly a structural issue rather than a voice issue. It's because I want readers to be able to, without me having to do awkward stuff about, oh, 20 years ago, but instead that the past will pretty much consistently signal that we're doing backstory, as Eleanor will talk about toward the end of the week. Um, and a lot of this novel is backstory. And so a, a lot of it is going to be in the past interleaved with the present stuff, which is the ongoing present of the 2014, wh where, which is the only quote-unquote plot part of the book. Um, my books tend to be kind of light on plot um, and, and sort of heavy on character, which is a huge amount of what backstory is all about. So there's first that, present tense, past tense, blah, da, 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 da. I'm still in the middle of it because it's present here, but it's going to be past. So this is a memory. It's, in fact, my memory when I was five and went to the World's Fair, 1965 World's Fair, with my parents. And so, in a way, in a way it makes it easier because it's my memory. That would seem to be, f right away, much easier because I'm not, I'm not having to think of making things up. And especially since it's an old memory from when I was little, the telling detail is basically all that's left after all these years. However, there is, I think, a difficulty when you're working from your real memory, which is you have a vivid visual memory. And when you have a really strong visual sense of what you want and what you want the reader to see, you actually have to be very careful 
not to overload the text and overdetermine it with getting the reader to see exactly what you clearly see in your head. That's not going to happen, and, and you need to let go of that idea. And so my, an, my initial memory of this house that I was in was that it had, uh, I'll read this very first paragraph. When he is five years old, his parents take him and his older sister Susan to the New York City World's Fair. They stay in a dark house with a covered porch, which belongs to some lady his mother knows. The front yard slopes down, getting steeper as it goes, dropping down a wall, and you can see it says six feet below, but dropping down a wall at the bottom to a busy street. During the boring evening when they talk, his parents seem to think he will play in this yard. But he can see the littlest stumble and he'll roll, roll faster, fall flailing, die under screeching tires. And my memory of that is in, is, is in fact this, was that I was worried my yard was not steeply sloping and did not have a busy street at the bottom and did not have a retaining wall. And I took one look at this yard as a five-year-old and just thought, you've got to be kidding me. This is not a place to play. So in a way, again, the theme is sort of obvious, but as a writer, you, you don't just want to channel the particular memory if you've got particular aims in mind. And this, this narrator becomes a scientist. He becomes an astronomer. And he, I have a scientific side of my personality, but I never really developed it. The fun part of doing this character is to take that part of my personality and as he becomes adult, this becomes a much bigger part of his life and the worldview is a much bigger part of his worldview than it is for me. And his emotional life is a lot more closed off and observant and self-protective than mine is. I don't have any trouble accessing those ideas, but I make them a lot stronger for him. So the thing that I wanted to do with this very first paragraph is a, well, one thing, I always like to know with kids' stuff how old the kid is. I want to know that really early on when I read or I write because it, for, to me it makes an enormous difference in a child's memory on the page if it's a five-year-old or a nine-year-old. And so one easy way to do it, which is the one I've chosen to do here, is start off with the clause when he's five years old. As a reader, I don't mind that. I, as a writer, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a problem. And I love being able to just locate instantly because you want the reader to visualize the kid. They can't visualize the kid if they've got no idea what age they are. Um, so when he's five years old, I wanted to emphasize as early as I could two things about this kid is that he has a naturally somewhat anxious personality that, that makes him think of possible disasters that other people might not think of. <laughs> but also that the way he thinks about them are somewhat geometrical and mathematical. That, that it's, it's the way he tends, so what he notes about and, and what he remembers about the lawn is, is not just that it's dangerous, but it, he imagines it like a geometrical exercise. The lawn is sloping, he is a potentially round object, he's roughly cylindrical if he's lying the wrong way on the lawn, and like a cylinder on a slope, he will start to roll faster and faster. And um, I actually rewrote about 10 or 12 times the, the description of the yard. The phrase, the front yard slopes down, getting steeper as it goes, um, and then dropping down a wall. I at first did, and it, this one of the things that I went through, again, because my visual memory is very clear, is, the, is, there, is there, there's the temptation to say, somehow imply exactly or approximately how big the yard is because you can remember very well when you and when it's your own memory and so it's like oh you know well it was sort of like 40 feet long and 
And then, and I remember the retaining wall at the end was about, it was about six feet, as, as, an earl, as the second to last draft here says. It was about a six feet drop on the retaining wall. There was a narrow sidewalk. I grew up in a suburb. I had and then spent very little time in the city. This was, of course, near New York City. I'd never seen a sidewalk that was only about this wide. It, it was a narrow street, and that's why they had this retaining wall that they built into the slope when they had ex tried to expand the street. But because they didn't have much room, they would put in a, a sidewalk about this wide with parking meters. And I was horrified is too strong a word, but I was really unsettled by how narrow this sidewalk was. Um, it just seems since I'd never seen a sidewalk that looked like that, it seemed weird and sinister. Um, and it added to the sense that if you rolled down the slope and zipped off this retaining wall, you would miss the sidewalk entirely. <laughs> and, and, and that just seemed, you know, it was like one of these, are they crazy, you know? <laughs> And, and so I originally went into this in much more detail because I remember it all. And that is the trap when you remember stuff, is you start to overload with stuff. And so I had this version about the narrow sidewalk and, and then the, the fact the number of cars that were coming by and how fast they were going. And I kept looking at it thinking, there's too much, you know? Uh, it, it, it just doesn't, the pacing doesn't feel right. It gives stuff that I want. I wish I could have it there. But I ended up with a paragraph that was about twice as long as this one. And I didn't want it that long. It take, it's too much throat clearing. So that's one of the things to always interrogate your stuff about. Can, can I get rid of stuff that I see, that I'm attached to, but does a reader, once I've established the anxiety, the rolling, the falling in front of the car, isn't that, isn't that basically what I need? Um, and, and so that, that was a lot of it, was cutting out this extra stuff. I had a second to last version. I did bring it into my workshop last year after there'd been this request to discuss sort of the things that we think about when we're writing. And I had the version that still had the six feet. I'd originally had more numbers in it because I remembered that the side, if you're going to say the narrow side, like two foot wide sidewalk and the six foot, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the lawn is 40 feet, and uh, you know, here's a diagram. And, and all that I had left was the six foot wall retainer because, of course, retaining walls could be like this. And I wanted to make sure a reader really saw you know, something like this. So I still had the six feet. But I wasn't that happy with that one number still in there. And when I showed it to my class and they were my workshop -y attendees and they read it, right away a couple of them said, gee, why is the six feet in there? And I agreed that it was this last holdover of this nervous need to overdetermine the, the, the visual aspect of what I'm doing. You know, obviously, you hope that readers will take a strong visual impression away, but, you, but, but one of the crucial things is to understand that you can't control that visual, vivid impression that they get beyond a certain pretty minimal point. You want to get them into the ballpark, but then what they will mainly take away, and the more freedom you give them, the more vivid it will be for them, and the more they will think that you did something amazingly evocative in your writing, is you let them supply that stuff out of their own, and that's why it's vivid to them. And, and, and then you, know, you, you must have had this experience before where you go back to read something you remembered 10 or 12 years ago with this very strong visual image, and then you can't find in there the thing that you thought the reader, the writer did to get you to see so vividly what it is that you remember. And, and that's because the writer didn't do it. Um, so again, to shorten this to that, you know, it, so the other thing I kind of wanted to just, which I wonder 
I wonder whether it takes sometimes a little while as a writer to get to this point where you are willing to keep going back over and over to the stuff that you've done and constantly tinker a little bit mm -hmm. with it. Um, look at, you know, again, every word counts, but look at, try, try to make sure that every word you're using is really the one that you want. And so, for example, also in, the, in this opening, this thing, the second sentence, they stay in a dark house with a covered porch which belongs to some lady his mother knows. It took me three or four tries, and again, I'm not asking you to then admire the polished gem that I've ended up with. I'm just trying to explain what I'm trying to do when I do it. This phrase, some lady, it took me three or four tries to get to that. I'm satisfied now with that phrase. Um, I originally had uh, a college friend, um, and, it, and in fact, it was a f college friend of my mother's. But I was forgetting that when I was five, I didn't know that that's who she was. I remembered later, because later on, I'd ask my mother, remember that when we stayed? And she's, oh yeah, I knew her from college. So I had college friend, and then I kept stumbling over it, thinking, five-year-old, college friend? Well, well. Um, when I was a kid, lady was the word we all, I always use. Of course, it varies from generation to generation and place to place. But, but you know, I was trying to remember. Was it woman? No, I didn't say woman. So it was lady. And then I originally described the house more because I remember the house. But again, I kept thinking, nobody, who cares about the house? It's just, it's just that I care about it because it's involved with this memory. So I kept cutting that stuff out until I realized, what's the one thing, if I wanted to say anything about this house at all, what's the one thing that bothered me most, the single thing? And that's that it was dark. She had a big tree in the front, which I don't describe here, but big tree in the front, and she had these big covered porches. It was a kind of the bungalow style, right, with the big eaves, the big front porch, low hanging. And it bugged the crap out of me how dark it was in the house. It added to this feeling of, where are we, you know, uh, danger, lurking, da-da-da. And so that's all that's, all that's left is, is the dark. Um, Sure. I, I'm really interested in this aspect of um, trying to interrupt. No, no, please. I'm, I'm just, I'm free associating at Pierre, so help me, join. I think some lady is really great because it does what you said. It's the five-year-old or future, right? The way he would think about it instead. But of course, the five-year-old is not thinking in artfully written whole sentences, right? So there is an essential artificiality to the project in general. Right. I wonder if you were, I wonder if that was you thinking, is that concept too unfivey? And I guess I, if you could talk for a couple of minutes about how you strike that balance between writing for adults uh, in good prose, but also trying to evoke the more primitive voice of the child. Yeah. No. And 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 you're right. The reason orphaned is circled is because I I don't at the moment have. Uh, an idea whether I want to keep that in or not, um, because I I do think this goes to just just that is I I a I don't know whether it's a tiny bit too fancy for this uh, kid at this age, um, or also I don't know whether I'm over nudging here. Um, whether I need anything like that anyway. Um, the, 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 what I'm going for, of course, is the idea that not only he'll be separated from them. This is so, this, se this second paragraph, right? On the way to the fair, subway doors open and close by themselves. A family entering a car could be sliced in two. Surely this happens daily. <laughs> Parents and older sister in the accelerating train looking dumbly back at orphaned five-year-olds on the platform. Um, I, you know, this is, yeah, this is one of those, I'll go through three or four more sessions of looking at that word and trying to figure out whether I want it. Um, 
I, I do want to suggest, but maybe I don't need to, that it's not just the fear, it's the fear that you'll never see them again. And, and is, that, is that obvious anyway? Um, and of course, as a, as a writer, this is, I guess, so obvious, it hardly bears saying, but one of the hardest things of all the things that you deal with, and I think to a certain extent this never goes away, is since you know what you mean and you know what you want to convey, it's incredibly hard to know what you are conveying adequately and what you're over conveying. Because it's the thing that separates you most from any of your readers. They have no idea what you're doing and you know what you're doing or know, know what you want to say. Nancy. No, no, please. Um, I, I don't have a, a set system, but when I'm working on this, this whole section is about 50 pages. Um, it starts with a bunch of these vignettes going forward in time, and then it ends with about 25 pages of him as an adult in the house when he's selling it. Um, and so I, for me, for me I, when I'm doing like a, like a, 50 page chunk or whatever, a chunk from a certain perspective. Um, I, I work on that without, chain, without doing anything else on the book because for me, once I think I'm in the zone of the way of this person's voice and way of thinking, I don't want to start comp competing it with other things. And then it's, there's no set system. Um, I do a lot of my rewriting I think this is, for me, this has worked great. If I'm feeling too lazy to do original writing that day, you know, instead of cleaning, I clean the kitchen also when I'm feeling too lazy to write. But even better is to call up previous stuff when you're just not feeling, you're not feeling the mojo and, and tinkering. Now, some writers like Proust tend to make things worse when they rewrite because they keep adding stuff. You know, so you also have to be, I hope I'm the kind of writer that doesn't screw up my stuff when I rewrite. There's always that problem. But if, you're, if you tend to be, I hope, you know, I, you know, good at, at really interrogating what you're doing, um, I, do it, I, I do it at any time when I feel like it, and it can be a huge amount. Um, but I like it, and some people don't like doing it. Um, that doesn't really, know, kind of. Could you put this into the past tense? You said you were going to impossibly put this in the yeah, past tense. Yeah, yeah. Then you can say orphan because that's part of his memory. And if you don't put it in the past tense, then maybe you have to either cut it or find a simple word like lonely kids, low cli lonely kids on platform, or, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I see exactly what you mean. I, I'm not sure if... When I put it in the past tense, I really want to imply that because it's in the past tense, it's actually him as an adult thinking back. That's why I, I originally wanted it in present. It's because I do want the sense that this is not his memory, but, but our privileged glam, gl glamps, glimpse <laughs> of a moment in his past that is his past in his mind, but it's somehow us there. Then you're taking the stance that it is an author presenting this. Well, reader. well, this is and this is the this is the um, very I go through these sure. Th this is the uh, extremely mm, what's the word complicated. You know, as as John said, um, when when we do third, every time we're doing anything as writers, that's not good old fashioned omniscient narrator. To a certain extent, we're cheating. Um, and I've just decided I'm comfortable with the con game or the cheating that's required. Um, and for me, I think maybe like a magic trick that you know it's not really magic and yet you take pleasure in in 
in the sleight of hand. I guess for me, that's part of the pleasure of doing the third person because it basically is smoke and mirrors. Um, because of course, I'm the omniscient narrator. I'm not Mark. Um, and, and I'm controlling everything and I'm choosing the words. So it's all that much, all there. And, and I think literally like some of the smoke and mirrors magic tricks, what attracts me is the idea of can I do this and somehow create the illusion a fair amount of the time that I'm not here, you know, that I'm not the one doing it. Um, you have some longer words in here, you know, you have animatronic, a little kid wouldn't know that. I think orphaned is very strong. Yeah. I think it creates the fear of what he's feeling. I don't know whether a kid would know it, they might, it's yeah. fine. I think it's strong. I'd keep it if I were you, but it's your choice. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's true that, that, like animatronic, although I was enough of a nerdy kid at five, I might have actually because, because but, but, but the point, though, is I definitely use words here that I didn't use at five. It's just animatronic might not have been one of them because I was so, you know, and I loved robots in general. And so the idea of, you know, Disney's animatronic. Who went to the 65 World's Fair? Oh, oh my people. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, anyway, you decide what to do about orphan, but to me it gives a very strong image, and he's right. scared. He's yeah. scared that his family will go, and he's standing there, orphan. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and Lorne doesn't say it. It doesn't say orphan. Yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't cut it out yet. No, it's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's, let's, the, the, the tiny bit farther, the fair is bright and hot. Mom calls it sweltering, which makes Mark think of, and then I first had, or this is like the fourth or fifth thing, but the one I printed out, think of them sliding around in their own sweat. And that seems, even though this is the fourth or fifth draft, that still seemed kind of awkward and wordy. Um, I also wanted something, oh, I then revoltingly, which like this, I think for me, this happens a lot where you add the, ad, you add the adverb, which you then later take out. Uh, I, I do a huge amount of adding adverbs and removing them later. Um, in 99% of the cases, as long as you really do remove it later, it's safe to add them. Um, <laughs> but, but, but. This is something they often say in like, you know, and sometimes when it's like these like the rules of writing, I tend to be very allergic to that. The one thing I think actually does work pretty well as a general rule is adverbs. Um, usually you don't want them. Um, and, and, but it's fine to tinker, throw them in, but then keep, once you put them in, keep looking at them. You know, because usually, of course, if you're doing a good job in the rest of the sentence, you don't need them. You know, it's the revolting lake, you know, sliding around in your own sweat. How revolting is that, right? You know, why, why, why say revoltingly? I like swimming better because it, it, there too, it thinks the sweltering and the swimming. This too is a specific memory of mine. It was the very first time I'd heard the word swelter as a kid was when my mother mentioned this at the fair. And by, from context, I knew what she meant. But it stuck in my head very vividly because I was so disgusted by the thought of swelter. <laughs> and so just trying to quickly, trying, trying to very, very quickly, briefly suggest what it is that might gross this kid out. You know, he's, he's fastidious. Um, you know, anxious, n fastidious, nerdy kid. Um, oh, it's a small, small world. Yes, um, there too. I originally, for people who've seen A Small, Small World, of course, it's at the uh, Disneyland. It has been now for years. Um, I saw it again as a 45-year-old uh, uh, with my daughters and um, fell apart. <laughs> the, I originally described this a lot more. You know, anyone who's seen it, you know, they, they, they're doing the, and they look like Canadians, you know, from uh, <laughs> South Park, the way the Canadians always speak like this. <laughs> Small, small world. It's like the entire world has been turned into Canadians. They're all, <laughs> and uh, and the and the 
the head, the, the whatever, the, the, the clack, you know, the ching, ching. It's really, it's, it's charming and spooky and, and, and hilarious all at once. And I originally described it much more, again, because I remember it so well. And then decided again, what am I going to stick with? I wanted to stick with this. That was the one thing I really wanted to mention, the way they, as they, as they sing. Um, one last thing, and then I'll take a brief look at the other one. The next thing about the Belgian waffles, that's like the famous thing about the, world, the World's Fair. It was what introduced the Belgian waffle. <laughs> the, the, the Belgian pavilion sold waffles. And, and it was like, you know, 95 degrees, and all these kids were eating these enormous Belgian waffles and vomiting uh, uh, on the, uh, next to the sidewalks. Um, they gave them, they made them with, you know, big sort of, uh, uh, the, as, it's, as I say here, you know, syrupy strawberries, highly sugared, and then big mounds of somewhat artificial oversweetened whipped cream. And they were just enormous. And I wanted that in there, but here too, sp I spent a fair amount of time on trying to describe these damn waffles. Be and, and, and it was the same sort of thing of over-determining them. I wanted to suggest how big they were, and I finally decided I really needed to do very little. If the point is that they're big, so, you know, big fluffy cushions, but I used to have, you know, I had like deep pits, deep square pits, <laughs> enormous pits, you know, Pits filled with cream, you know, overflowing. I just kept trying all this stuff because, but, you know, the fact that Mark ends up puking one up on the sidewalk, you don't really need to. It's, big, it's a big waffle. <laughs> you know, bigger than he could handle. Um, let me take, let's take a look just briefly at the Saskia. Now, the point of, uh, I'm going to read from this for the reading on Wednesday, and I was glad to hear when John said that he was going to set the tone, and this was going to be crass week. <laughs> um, Saskia, who, who is a character in an earlier novel of mine, and, and she's, she's back in this one, um, she has a much, much different personality than Mark. So here, I'm not, I don't have the problem or the advantage of drawing on my own memories. I can create as I go. I'm not as burdened with the problem of editing out this tidal wave of visual and, uh, and emotional memory that I have to do with Mark. Instead, it's the other problem of trying to generate stuff, trying to make sure that it, that it, that it feels plausible and real, yeah, I don't have to worry about plausibility with Mark's memories because they're all mine. Of course, they must be plausible because they happened. With her, you know, plausibility comes into it. What I wanted with her from the very beginning, I, and there too, sort of the decision that I made in how to start this. With Mark, I wanted to start with memory and sort of simple, factual memory because I wanted the, the theme of Mark's character to be both nostalgia and fact. That he is very passionate, more than I am, very passionate about the idea that facts are what matter. Fancy schmancy speculation, da da da. He doesn't read much in the way of literary fiction. He thinks that's all, you know too fancy, he reads nonfiction. He, and so, and so it's, it's very much what happened when I was five, da 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 da, you know. Saskia is completely different. Saskia has grown up to become an actor. And I wanted the very beginning of Saskia's thing to be her not sitting and saying, here's the yard the way it was, and, you know, the, the concern about the yard. <coughs> Her thing is, it's very, it's, I wanted it to initially be difficult to tell what was really going on. Because for her, a huge amount of her voice is her spinning out possibilities, ideas, characters, and personas out of her own head. This is where she gets her energy from. 
Um, and so I didn't want to start off saying Saskia was 45, an actor, living in New York City. Um, there too, when you're doing the close third, introducing characters is always a little bit, you have to, this is where you really start to figure out how to do the smoke and mirrors fudging. Because although I'm aware that I'm 54, it's not like I walk down the sidewalk going, Brian Hall, 54 year old, <laughs> you know. I mean, sometimes I do, but. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's always when you're starting with, with the, the close third. It's always how do I get some of this information in, stuff that's super obvious too. So for her, I wanted actually it to start off for the reader somewhat dislocated. And so this opening line, since the reader doesn't know yet who Saskia is, she's a slave girl in the mumbo jumbium mines of Altair VI. And so right away, what I'm kind of hoping is, hoping is going on is presumably there's a presumption on the part of the reader that surely she's not really, is this really going to be a book where one of the characters is a slave girl? And then mumbo jumbium? What the hell is that? You know? Um, but what I'm trying to suggest in that very first line is that mumbo jumbium, like whenever Humbert Humbert names anything in Lolita, including himself, that's not really, of course, the name of these minds. But that she is, of course, thinking in her head about, you know, the babble, anyone who, of course, watches, you know, Star Trek or any of these old science fiction, you know, the techno babble stuff, which is part of the hilarious fun of a lot of these things. So these, these mines are, you know, Redimian mines or Ro Rhododian mines or whatever. But she's got no patience for that. And so she thinks of them as the mumbo jumbium mines. Um, and then you have the second sentence, you know, please, please, would you untie me? No doubt she has a skimpy, torn scrap of shirt, great abs, and firm, full breasts, probably deliciously grimy. Wouldn't you love to lick them clean, boy wanderer? Ooh, my hardening nipples seem to have burst my shirt straight off me. <laughs> she does a more hurried take. Please, please, would you untie me? On second thought, don't touch those knots. Surely a pasty-faced 14-year-old such as yourself is man enough to know how to take a hog-tied woman to heaven. What the hell is going on, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and I, I wanted to keep that slight sense of, okay, I, maybe I know what's going on, but I'm not quite sure. Um, and of course, it, it, may, it, it may be obvious right away to a lot of you, or may obviously, I mean, you know, she's in a recording booth, and she's recording a video game. And, um, and this is something that actors who, she's not a very successful actor, and so she does voice work. That's where her main bread and butter is doing voice work for video games, where you are in the booth for three hours at a stretch, and you take a break, come back for three hours, and they hand you all of these little snippets of dialogue that you read. And the reason I loved starting with this was A, plausibility because I wanted her to not be a very successful actress. I like the kind of troubadour wandering lifestyle of the not very successful actor. They go where they can possibly go, even more than writers do. They go wherever they need to go. They do a wide variety of things when they're told to do them. They never turn a job down. And so if they're asked to be a tomato in a tomato juice commercial, they, they, they try to feel the tomato you know they if they're they're like they're like instruments I think and the actors that I've known when I love talking to them is how much unlike writers who are control freaks how much they want to try to be instruments um, and the more they feel they're taking anything given to them and trying to make something out of it no matter how unpromising it seems I, I sort of love that aspect of it and so I wanted to start with her doing this stuff but then also, the thing about video game stuff is that you're asked in very quick succession to take a whole bunch of roles very fast, unless you're the main star of the video game. But if you're otherwise, you're doing, you know, the slave girl on Altair 6, and you've got the 12 lines. You have to do stuff like, anyone who plays video games know this, you have to do a fair amount of vocalizations. You spend a huge amount of time in the booth going, <coughs> 
oh! You know? And s you have six ways of doing, doing dying, right? Um, because as you play and you're fighting and everything, the characters around you are making these noises. They can't just go uh, every time because within five minutes of playing, the illusion will be destroyed. Everyone's dying the same way. So they cycle through a random generator about a dozen different ways of taking a knife to the gut, the sound. And that's what you, that's what you record in the booth. Um, so, but I also wanted to suggest that um, oh, well, two things. Saskia has a fairly complicated relationship with men. And I wanted early on, from the very beginning, in the way she thinks about things, to have a, a highly sexualized and, su and very ambivalent sense of the way men think about women. And, and so that, and this is why, so from the very beginning, um, this thing about, you know, the pasty face 14, you know, like John, the masturbating in front of the masturbating woman on the video screen, you know. The, and of course, if you play video games, you know exactly what I'm talking about, the way the women, the fighters, you know, are, are, are dressed and the, 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 the body shapes that they have. Um, but I also wanted to suggest that she herself loves language. Let's see, is this got a page? Oh, mine doesn't have a page two. That must be a, oh no, there it is. Hey, uh, sorry. Um, where is this? Oh, actually maybe it's on page four, which I didn't copy. Uh, sorry. There's a bit where she goes into all the different moaning you have to do when you're killed, um, which I then won't, won't discuss. Since we only have like eight more minutes, um, why, don't we, why don't I just, if there's anything people want to say, since I've now kind of wandered around long enough. Is, is this Saskia part, is this the preliminary noodling around like the Mark part, or is this more what you're going to put in the text? Um, it's, I mean, I, I, I certainly don't know whether it's exactly what I'll do in, in the text, but, but it, is, it is something that I've worked on a bit. Okay, so this is more polished and settled than this. This is, this, this is your first ex early explorations of who Mark is. Well, the fact that the Mark one has a few mm -hmm. crossouts doesn't doesn't really mean that uh -huh. this one is more under construction than this yeah. one. Okay. This one doesn't have any markouts because this one I printed up really recently. Okay. This one I printed up several weeks ago okay. and have had time since then to rethink a couple of little things. So I guess my question is 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 the intention when you wrote both pieces the same? I'm finding out who Mark is. I'm finding out who Saskia is. The intention was the same with these two pieces. Um, I th yeah, I, I, uh, I th if I understand what you mean. Yeah, you know, I am not writing the story I'm sending to Plowshares. I'm writing the stuff to understand the character who will be in the story. That it, Was that your intention? Well, um, I mean, this, this, if I'm understanding you yeah. correctly, this is, is probably not far away from what would actually be in the book. Okay. Um, the the note-taking that I do about trying to establish mm -hmm. who the characters, that, those, that looks completely different okay. from what I do. Th right. Those are um, just, uh, re I mean, they're clearly notes, clearly notes. Um, half sentences and mm -hmm. da 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 da. So this, this, is, this is my attempt at the moment to actually write the text, right, yeah. Put those notes in. Okay. But 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 with 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 I mean Saskia's narrative is by its nature, and I want it to be much more um, improvisatory, because that's basically it's not just her job as an actor to be constantly 
trying to inhabit different roles. But one of the reasons she became an actor is because she loves spinning out possibilities and, uh, and, then, and then backing up and, and re-spinning them out. There's a later section here, it's like page six or seven. She has this last thing just before she breaks for lunch or the end of the day where she's gets, she's, it's again, it's still the video game, but she's supposed to be expressing the character, one of the characters has betrayed her character. And she's got this line, uh, you bastard. He's, she's just found out that he's gonna leave her. He's taken off in the shuttle craft. The, the main player, that's the boy wanderer, could be a girl, and she refers to this, but it's the person actually playing the game, has an option during this to take her or leave her when he zips off in a, in a shuttle. And then there's certain consequences if you take her or leave her. And, um, and she's the less important character that gets left behind. And so she's, she records the one if he leaves her behind, betraying her. And she says, you bastard. And it's the, it's the very last thing she has to do. And then as she walks off to lunch or dinner, whatever it was, she, she goes through like 15 different ways in her head of saying the line as she imagines the feeling. And partly, it was fun to do, um, partly it allowed me to use a whole bunch of different, her vocabulary is pretty big because she grew up as a really voracious reader. That's like her role in the first novel that she's in. So she's got this kind of enormous literary vocabulary. She loves fooling around with words, whereas Mark is very suspicious of flowery language. So I wanted to be able to draw on this literary sensibility of constantly spinning out different ways of saying the same thing or close to the same thing. But I also wanted to indicate that she's got a big thing about being betrayed by men. Um, and that has a lot to do with her background. And so when she has this line about you bastard, she doesn't want to say it just three times for the recording booth. She wants to say it 60 times. But they don't take 60 takes. And so it's when she's going off to dinner that she imagines all the different ways she could say to a male, you bastard. Um, but but I, don't, I don't say that that's what's going on. I just give all of those different options as they run through her head. Um, Frank? Brian, I'm perhaps the only person in here who could not play video. <laughs> Says over the speaker, right. that you're a slave girl. Yeah, no, great, great question. I, I, I do eventually say, um, let's see, I guess page three is Phil's voice in her, in her, she asked the team in the engineering booth, is this woman young, old, attractive, what? And uh, Phil's voice in her ear, middle-aged, forbidding, square face, mammoth headdress. He's got the artwork in front of him. She doesn't. So she wants, she wants to be able to picture what the character, the avatar, looks like. Um, so I wait until page three to do that. Your question, you could totally start it the way, the way, you, the way you said, and that would be fine. And then the only difference is, and it, it's, not a, it's not a matter of good or bad or sophisticated or unsophisticated, it's purely underneath the text what other emotions you want to try to generate in the reader. And so for me, I deliberately wanted to withhold the sense of where she actually is to heighten the sense, because I'm, tr I'm, tr I'm trying to think of her subjective feeling and tr I'm trying to signal from the very beginning where she really lives. And, she, and, and the way her mind works and the way her emotions work is the fact that she's in the booth doesn't matter. One of the reasons she's pretty good at this, at this particular kind of recording, is because she, she really does love forgetting as much as she can that she's in a booth and she really tries to think of herself as you know these characters and and I so I want the I want the text to to start that way so that the booth matters so little it doesn't show up until page three 
Uh, now, you run the risk of alienating readers, of course. That's always the problem. Um, and those are just choices that you have to make about, about you know, who to, how many people to scare off if they, if they don't like that kind of dislocation. I want to add to that, that, that it goes both ways. Like, I, I often find alienating when a writer is explaining the situation too much to me. In other words, I, I, I feel like this, on that continuum where you land, as you're saying, should probably come from the intent of the text and the, uh, and the way the character thinks uh, first. Yeah, it's always, it's, I mean, this, 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 that constant question of what's, if you're doing th close third, what's important to the character who's, who you're channeling? Uh, so that not only means what they'll remember and not remember, what they'll notice and not notice, but it also means what percentage of the text does X or Y, because that's, that's where their obsessions are, that's where their orientation is. Um, so the blindness is not just factual blindness, but it's emotional blindness uh, or locational blindness. Uh, uh, and just being as conscious of it as you can so that when you're making these decisions, you're at least, they may, they may end up being bad decisions, but, but the point is you're consciously making them, whether they turn out to be wise or unwise, but that you're thinking at every moment, you know, this is the person I'm trying to be. Jeffrey, were you? Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, Jeff, yes. So, sort of a related comment. You, uh, second line, please, please, would you untie me? You could do it without as elaborately depicting the studio as he did, but maybe there's a hidden microphone or something. You know, it could be more subtle. <laughs> Just a question. And then the, the phrase, no doubt she has a skimpy, torn scrap of shirt. Right. It feels to me like it's, she's being generated from the author's imagination into being like, no doubt, you know, as I think about this, she's probably wearing a skimpy t-shirt. Oh, right, so that's... As opposed to, of course, she's asked again to wear a skimpy, like for it to really truly be from her point of view, of course she has a skimpy yeah. outfit on, right? Yeah. Uh, or, um, or is it just simply she has a skimpy dress on? Is it just the physical? Yeah, what... I mean, yeah, I mean, A, I'm not quite sure what, she, what I'm trying to do there, which may not be that clear, is that she, since we eventually just figure out she's in the booth, okay. um, and she has seen, this is often true when you do, I haven't done voice work, but I've, I know a little bit about it. When you do the voice work for these things, you sometimes see some, some of the artwork. This, this is like a third installment of this game. So she knows what a lot of this game looks like. But the actual particular avatar you're doing, when they say, now you're a slave girl, they don't flash up, this is what you look like. Um, and so, but she's, she knows how these games work. And so she thinks, eh, if I'm a slave girl, and knowing what this is like, I probably look like this. And, and yeah, big boobs, you know. Um, man, do those slave girls get fabulous nutritional workouts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, sorry, and then Jeffrey, and then we, oh, so, and then Jeffrey, and then, and then we better stop. Well, yeah. Or should we stop now? No, it's about the uh, workshop leaders, not me. Well, well since Jeff, well, 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 just Jeffrey then, because we, because you, because you would ask, and then. Since this talk was called two openings, I figured it'd go with the question of writing something that involves multiple openings, <coughs> and that's uh, a series called John Crowley's Egypt Quartet. Have you ever read that? Mm. John Crowley's Egypt Quartet. Highly recommend it. It has the first album. Of Quartet has like a few different openings. You don't know what's going on for the first 50, maybe 60 pages. And it does basically everything you were talking about. You don't know a lot of what's going on. You have to put it together yourself. And I was just wondering, you know, two prologues, for instance, what would you make of that? Two, uh, what would I make of it if I did it? Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> 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 I mean, since we have to stop, I'll privately get a better sense of what you're talking about. But good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.